So I will introduce now, we'll tell you a little bit about David and Cecily. So David graduated from Commonwealth in 1982, three years before I arrived. Um, and he graduated, he went to Swarthmore, came back for a brief career, two year career as a teacher at Commonwealth, overlapping with me then, and then went on to law school. And in 1993, he graduated magna cum laude from University of Michigan Law School, where he was the executive article editor of the Michigan Law Review. He was a law clerk then, he, he clerked in 93-94 uh, for then US Court of Appeals Judge Stephen Breyer, who went on, as you know, to the Supreme Court, and, and also was a law clerk in 1994-95 for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. After his clerkships, he worked as a litigation associate at Ropes and Gray as, as deputy legal counsel to Massachusetts governors William Weld and Paul Cellucci and as counsel to Murphy and King. In 2004, David shifted gears again and founded bluemassgroup.com, a widely read political blog covering Massachusetts and national law, politics, and policy. He also has a distinguished career as a, as a singer as, uh, in, in, in opera and uh, musical theater. So um, he is a, he's a man of many talents. He is now Deputy State Solicitor for Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy. And he, as, as we said, he also is both an alum and a former faculty member. And we are, um, we're delighted to welcome David. Cecily Morrison uh, graduated from Commonwealth in 1998. She spent her senior year at Commonwealth. And Cecily is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge uh, in the UK. She holds a first degree in ethnomusicology from Barnard College and a PhD in computer science from the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on the interface between artificial intelligence and human computer interaction. She works to create AI systems that enable people to extend their own capabilities. And she currently is leading a team that is working, creating, that's creating visual agent technology with and for people who are blind or low vision. She's recently developed a physical programming language that inclusive of children who are blind or low vision, which has been commercialized as Code Jumper. Um, in the autumn, Cecily, and this is a first, I think, for a Commonwealth alum, she was named on the Queen's Birthday Honor List and awarded an MBE, Member of the Order of the British Empire, for her work, which is a, which is a real distinction. Congratulations, Cecily. She lives in the UK with her partner and her two sons, and we are delighted that she's able to join us today. Thank you both, uh, David and Cecily, for, uh, for being with us today. And I'll turn it over to David. Great, thank you so much, Bill, and thank you everyone uh, for being here uh, on this uh, rather rainy afternoon or uh, evening, as the case may be for our, for our UK branch. Um, so uh, let's let's just dive right in, Cecily. Um, we heard uh, from from Bill's introduction. We heard just a little bit about sort of what your what your title is and what what your job is at Microsoft Research. But uh, I would love to to have you talk a little bit more about you know what what your job actually is at Microsoft. Who else is on your team? And, and, and what kinds of projects your, your team uh, uh, is working on now or has worked on recently? Sure. Um, first of all, very, very excited to be here um, and connecting back to, to, to Commonwealth, a place that I, I enjoyed immensely, that even if it was just one year that I was there. So what do I do? Now, that's always a good question. Um, a busy day and you think, what have I done? But what our team focuses on is to, to build out uh, visual agent technology. This is, you can imagine an agent like Siri or Cortana or Google Now, things you might've experienced, Alexa, and you add computer vision to them. So the aim of our team was to imagine how could we build out such technologies that were gonna enable people who are blind or low vision to get a better understanding of the world around them. And we're particularly focused on enabling to, to interact more easily in the social contexts uh, that they're in. So that, to do that, I mean, the whole range of things from, first of all, what does that mean? What, what experiences are we trying to design? So we, we, we go out and we, we work with blind and low vision people and we're doing design sessions. We follow them around to understand what they do. In fact, 
this project kicked off with, uh, we followed four um, blind or low vision Paralympic athletes to the Rio Paralympics in 2016 um, to really understand what these incredibly talented people do to get around in the world without vision. But then we go all the way from there and to how do we imagine new technologies? How do we build out these new algorithms? And then how do we solve a lot of those societal challenges? If we start to bring in systems that are really enabling to people who are, who, are, who are blind, that often means things like recognizing other people, which is not something everybody's comfortable. So how do we think about ways that we can enable people who are blind and low vision, but at the same time, think to the people uh, in, in the context and the communities that they're in. So our work spans right from the beginning of understanding people through building new types of systems, through deploying them and understanding their impacts on community and society. It's not work I do by myself. So I, I work mainly with a background in human computer interaction, but I work with engineers, designers, researchers in, in machine learning and computer vision. And we all work together to, to bring this vision forward. Great. Um, so uh, there's a couple of terms in there that you that you uh, uh, used and, and that I think will come up a lot in this discussion. I would love for you to just quickly define, if you can, um, what do you mean by the terms artificial intelligence by the t and by the term machine learning? And, and, and how are these things different from, uh, you know, sort of what we think of as, as ordinary or, or, you know, not th the computer programming that is not those things, put it that way. Um, sure. So probably many people have heard the term artificial intelligence or, or AI. It's something that's thrown around quite a lot in the media. Um, and it covers a very wide uh, range of things. I like to think of it more specifically as, as machine learning. And let's think of machine learning as something that takes some data, it then has an algorithm that learns the pattern on that data, and then it gives you a prediction. So something people might be quite uh, familiar with, you can take something, if you have an, an Alexa or a voice agent in your house, it's been trained on a whole corpus of speech that relates the speech sound to a word. So it'll have a speech sound, it'll have a word it's paired to. Some algorithm's gone through and, and uh, learned that pattern match, and then it makes a prediction. So when you say, Alexa, stop, hopefully it's figured out uh, that stop means, you know, you, you can finish what you're doing. Um, but of course, that's always tricky because maybe there's other sounds in the background, maybe you have the, the washing machine going, maybe there's music playing. So it, it has to figure out the closest pattern. So that's what machine learning is. And it can learn across anything where there's data and the prediction is needed. Now that's quite different from many of the computer systems we've used before, um, which we might give a more formal term to as a deterministic system. So whatever I put in, I can expect the same thing out. Now machine learning is not like that. Whatever you put in, you get a set of probabilities of something that might come out. So there, they're quite different systems in the ways that we have to build uh, experiences around them. But I would say there's a lot of power coming in what we're now able to do with machine learning. It's just coming in the last couple of years. And uh, does, so you say that it's that it's a question of probabilities and as, as time goes on and, and the machine has sort of more experiences if you want to put it that way, does, does it, do, do its responses become more refined? And how does that, happen? Um, yeah, I, I guess in a very simple view, the more, it'd be nice to call it experience as if it's people, but machines aren't actually like people. So let's, let's get the machine world. And um, the more data they have, mm -hmm. then, then the, the better they, they get. So if we think about something called ImageNet, that's most of the, the image technologies that we use in, in the world are trained on this one data set. It's 14 million uh, images. Uh, mostly scraped off the internet. So yeah, if you have 14 million images, you're starting to get uh, pretty good. The interesting things that come is that one of the things that we've done in our work is to put these systems out into the real world. Machine learning people have sort of kept themselves in, in the lab. It's a bit like um, of the past, the, what they would have called armchair anthropology. Well, machine learning is a bit like armchair machine learning. I've got my data set, I downloaded it. I've created my algorithm. I've now tested this on the data set. And then I ask somebody else to figure out if it's going to work in the real world. Oh, we'll just, we'll just engineer it so it works. Well, we've taken a very different perspective than that, that the data that comes from the real world is different. Data supplied by people themselves is different. And we need to build different kinds of algorithms 
to make that work. And we need to help people using those algorithms or using the systems built on those algorithms understand why their system is working or not working. Okay, great. So um, much more to say, but before we do, um, there is a, a short video. Okay, so uh, that's incredibly cool. Um, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's extraordinary to see, uh, to, to just sort of watch in real time how this device helps, uh, helps this blind child interact with, with a whole group of people sitting around a dinner table, which you know, is something I, 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 I take it, something that sighted people just sort of take for granted to interact with a small group of people sitting around a table, but that for someone who is blind or low vision is actually quite, uh, can be quite difficult for lots of reasons. So um, I, I'm curious, what are, some of the, uh, maybe just sort of talk through some of the challenges as you were developing, as you're, you and your team were working on this technology and figuring out what it needed to do and what it needed to not do. Um, what were some of the things you had to overcome uh, to get this to work in its current form? Sure, there are lo lots of things. It's been a project going on for a number of years. We thought we would be done in a year. Um, we're four years in, we're getting pretty close. Um, <laughs> But uh, let's just start at the beginning. I think the most um, perhaps unexpected or maybe most interesting challenge was just thinking about what the system could do. So taking ourselves back five years at the time, a lot of the other big tech companies were coming out with these systems that would compete against other people. So we, we saw Google have this big competition against the Go champion. Could, could Google's AI system beat the Go champion? And one of the things that we were thinking, and, and Microsoft soon came out quite quickly after that saying, you know, why would we build AI systems that are going to compete against people? What's, what's the use of that? You know, we really want to enable and augment people's capabilities. Um, but to try and take that vision and bring that into a real system was, was a real journey. Because how do you design a system when you don't know what capability you're going to augment? And it would have been easy to say, well, blind people can't see, so let's be their eyes. Let's imagine the world. But actually, blind people are extraordinarily capable of, of making sense of their world uh, in a non-visual way. So how is it that technology can come in and enable things where things don't quite go to plan? And I think we think of disability um, in, in our team as the, what often is referred to as the social model of disability, so the gap between what an environment allows versus the capabilities that someone has. And technology has an important role to play in, in making that gap as small as possible. So we were looking at, well, what, what is that gap and what is it that we, we need to do? So that was our first real challenge. And at first we thought, well, we need to be something maybe like a guide or like a guide dog. And pretty soon you start working with people and you clearly like, like, I don't need a guide dog. <laughs> you know, I'm perfectly able to get to the part of all by myself. Um, and so really then we started going deep into their strategies and, and where could all this ability of bringing information together from sound, from smell, from touch, what could we add to that? And what we found is that we could be a redundant piece of information that made that process a bit more robust. We could provide information, particularly about the dynamic parts of the environment, people who people don't really like it when you touch them too much, particularly in a public place. Um, and they're moving around a lot, so they're hard to follow. And so by providing this extra bit of information, we could close that gap for many people to really enable them to be independent sense makers. So that was perhaps one of the, the hardest parts of the journey. And it might seem very simple to just say, well, a system should do this. But I think with AI in general, the more we think hard about what it should do, the more likely we are to get the benefit we want in society. Um, and then of course that journey went on and people didn't do it all with what we thought they were gonna do once we built it. And again, we can see that moving on is that we, Traditionally, the designers and researchers have been the ones who determine what technology does. But I think in the future, we are going to be the people who provide enabling capabilities and people themselves are gonna go out and find out how it extends uh, their own capabilities. And just to close with a, a final a particular example, that boy that you saw there, um, TH, he told us he wanted to find his friends in school. Well, we, we quickly learned that that's not what he did at all. He went and found his teachers and his mother pointed out to us that if you don't know where your teachers are and you say something you shouldn't say, you get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Be safe and know where your teachers are. So it's quite interesting that, that often what we imagine and what we need, it can be quite different. But even to go on from that, we then went on to go back and study what he was doing. And we started to see that 
he was getting people's names read out that he already knew who he was talking to. Now that's very strange. Why would you use a system to do something you could already do yourself? Um, and there we started to get really deep into understanding that he was using this to augment his, his, his uh, spatial attention. We need spatial attention to communicate. Um, spatial attention for people with vision is visual attention. And it's very hard, as you might have noticed on Zoom, or if you try and have a conversation with your back to them, it's quite hard to maintain your attention. And that's, that's the ongoing reality for someone who's blind. So he had used this system to be, make it easier for him to focus on someone and therefore increase his ability to have an extended conversation. So I think that to me is the, the power of AI. And it was a humbling experience to know that we weren't going to design it, but we were gonna be opening up possibilities for other people to make uh, imaginations of what AI could do for them. So, right. And then just to follow on that, um, uh, I mean, you've already touched on it a bit, but, um, but can you talk a little bit about, about your team's work with the blind and the low vision community and how, how that sort of uh, back and forth or interaction or collaboration or whatever it is um, has, has helped, this, helped this project uh, uh, move forward? Sure. I mean, the blind and low vision community has been great to, to work with. Again, we might have gone into this thinking we we're designing for this community, but really we're designing with this community there. They were early adopters of agent technologies. They were using Siri as a, a proper tool far before anyone else was doing it. Um, so we really wanted to understand what they were doing and how they were doing it. Our very first uh, uh, exploration in the space is we followed four Paralympic athletes to, to the Rio Games, very capable people. And we started to just watch. How do, how, do they, how do they manage in the world? What strategies do they use? And where can technology fit? And through that whole process, we, we've had a whole team of blind and low vision people, and now we work mainly with children um, who work alongside us, who imagine technologies, we build them out, we give them to them, they try them, we study what they do, they tell us what they need, and iteratively we work towards a vision um, of making something that, that will be useful for them and for, for the community that they're part of. Yeah, and the example that you gave about where um, where where the boy was 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 asking people's names to be repeated, right? That that sounds like the sort of thing that you would not necessarily have guessed going in if you were designing for them. You wouldn't necessarily ask the machine to do that. But was it? And then did he he or 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 you know other folks in the community were the ones that told you? Well, this would really be helpful. Yeah, that's also been really interesting when you start to build that technology. And if you're really successful in a technology like this, people don't always have a good idea of what they're doing with it. Um, so we also have done a lot of work and built out a whole set suite of tools to help us study what people do. So we're capturing all the data, we're capturing all the annotations, and then we have a ways of searching through that data to really look for, for patterns. And we, we, we work with people from all different disciplines that bring their insights into this data. Um, so it's, it, it comes from all sides. I think that's, that's the way it works best. Interesting. Um, so there's another term that, um, that has come up a couple times in the conversation, and, and this, also, this certainly seems very relevant to this, and the term is human-computer interaction. Um, I assume at some level that's sort of like it, it, it is what it sounds like, but is there any sort of further refinement uh, that, that you can give us on, on what that means to you uh, as, a, as a professional in the field, as opposed to just sort of the lay understanding? Sure. Um, so it is probably, as you guessed, so where our particular focus as a field is on understanding how do we build experiences that allow people to interface between machines, in this case, AI systems, that could be any computer machines, and, and the human experience. Um, so often we think of things as core technologies, things that might enable an experience, but on top of that, we need to build out experiences. And perhaps rather than me trying to explain it, I can give an example of, of what are the kinds of things that we might need to, to think about. So in a system like this one, the one you saw that, that uh, TH was using, it's quite a simple system. When he, when he looks at somebody, it provides the, the, the name uh, of who they are. Um, it's slightly more complicated under the hood. We actually contain a whole model of the world that enables us that as he turns his head in real time to, to really nail in real time who's there. And then that information is provided to him in spatialized uh, audio. So that means if the person is off to the left or he's turning his head and he passes by someone, he'll hear them in the position uh, where they are. So it's basically taking that visual spatial information that many people who with vision are used to and make putting it into sound uh, or audio spatial information. Now, 
there's lots of challenges you think, well, that should work straight away. Um, but actually there's a lot of work we needed to do to help people make that a powerful experience. Um, now, TH is growing rapidly, but at the time in that video, he's about 11. Um, and that he was still smaller than most of the adults around him. So that meant when he looked at an adult, he was generally looking at their chest. And of course, if you're looking at someone's chest and not someone's face, it can't identify who the person is. Um, so one of the things that, that we needed to do, um, both in terms of the architecture of our system, was not just to go after faces, but to make sure that we could recognize bodies, people, as well as faces. And then we provide a whole set of sound sets to help the user orient towards a face so they can recognize that person. So it could be that they're looking at their chest and we need to give them some sounds to help them look up till they click into a face. Could be they're looking at the person's back and they don't know whether the person is back to front of them. And we need to help them come around to the front for that person to, to, be, um, to be seen. So a lot of our work in the experience side is taking these algorithms which might, might work in, in, in theory and actually making an experience out of them that's gonna really work. Uh, for a person. Um, just to take a brief uh, sort of nuts and boltsy kind of detour. So the, the device looks like it's basically a, a sort of a, a band around, around his head. Um, where, does the, where does the computing power live? Uh, surely it is not all in that, in that small device, as much as we would love for that to be the case. I gather that we're probably not quite there yet. So how does it connect to, to this enormous sort of uh, uh, data set that you, that you had mentioned earlier? Sure. So um, one thing that, that the pictures don't show um, is that uh, when we've been deploying these in schools in the last year, there's actually a, a quite a big box. So I'm not so good at feet anymore. I'm better, but better at meters. But imagine maybe three quarters of a meter by half a meter. That's let me maybe about two feet by one and a half feet, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, box that's maybe about a meter off the floor. This box is on wheels, thank goodness. But otherwise, it's traveling around <laughs> into the room that, that's going on. So we call this a server box. So it has um, uh, two 16 gigabyte GPUs. Um, these are big computational um, powerhouses um, to be able to process that amount of data in real time to, to rate these experiences. And that's part of what we do in research is that we're trying to push the experiences of tomorrow. So you're not going to see this out in product anytime soon. Um, but we we can we can prototype and test out and enable these experiences through these sort of larger um, uh, compute boxes. Um, but fairly soon this stuff will be happening in the cloud. And again, that will just be one more interesting research challenge as we think about for a user, I want to have something happening on device that I need really fast and maybe something that I can I can have a little bit slower going on in the cloud and then I'm going to be having those back and forth. And of course, it makes a very exciting job for a human computer interaction researcher like myself, because then you have two different places that models could go wrong and the two different places the user might need to understand. And really the user doesn't want to understand anything. They just want to get on with their day. So how do we, how do we make that a, a seamless process for, for them? And does the device uh, communicate wirelessly with the, with the box that you described? Yeah. Yeah, so at the moment, again, these are ways we prototype. So you can imagine maybe in a the future, there's something like a smart glasses might, might be attached either wirelessly by, by Wi-Fi or um, through, through cable or through Bluetooth to your phone in your pocket kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, were there any, I'm sure there must have been, um, tell us about some of the, the sort of like really unexpected things that you came across. Like what really surprised you as you were uh, trying to get this to work with with this person and with and with the people around him. Um, well, I think I've already given some examples of the experience that surprised us, but let, let's move on to some of the more technical examples. Um, I think I'll never forget in my, my entire life the day that our machine learning uh, lead, very uh, senior uh, computer vision person within Microsoft and within the community, he came flying down the stairs to us. He went ninety nine percent. And we looked at him and we said, of what? He said, the algorithm, we got 99% accuracy. And we said, well, we have 10% accuracy. <laughs> like, have you given us the wrong build? And, um, and, and again, that just showed the real difference between technology that works in the armchair, in theory, on the data sets, and technology that actually works um, um, in the real world. So I think we had expected a difference, but I don't think we had expected a difference uh, so, so large. So that was one sort of interesting challenge that we've been working on. And it's really shaped um, across our whole research lab, 
changing the way that we think about what machine learning needs to do and how we need to start testing out algorithms right from the start rather than building them on, on these static data sets that don't really represent the experiences and data coming from what people, people are doing in the world. I think the second thing that it didn't surprise us but was a, a really interesting um, challenge was all of the issues that we would now refer to as responsible AI. That wasn't a term that existed perhaps when we started. Um, and really thinking through an experience that it's not just about the user. We know what we built worked really well for the users, but obviously they're, they're in a school setting or they're, they're in a work setting and there are lots of other people involved in that process. Sometimes we call them bystanders um, or communicators. Um, how do we make an experience that's gonna work for them? That's, it's not that common that we think about people outside the, the user. And to give you one um, good example of, of really a, a change in insight that we had there is that we had built this device for the user thinking that the user needed information about the world around him. But actually any communication is between two people. It's always a two way road. Um, so just augmenting what the user can do doesn't necessarily help the communication partner have the information they need. So a blind child in school often really struggles because he has to wait or she has to wait until another child comes and says and interacts with them. They can't reach out proactively. But also the other children didn't want to reach out proactively because they didn't know how to start a conversation with someone whose eyes they couldn't catch. You know, because one of the ways we start a conversation is to kind of check out, are they free? Are they interested? Should we have a chat? Um, so we had to, we actually built out this an external display um, that enabled the other person to know when they were being recognized, um, which opened the door for them to initiate a conversation and to really align to, to a, a communication. So I think that was perhaps one of our most interesting uh, insights is that we weren't building systems for users, we were building systems to, to enable and support an interaction between two people or two, two or more people. Yeah, it's uh, it, endless variables it seemed that, that you sort of need to need to take into account and find ways to control for. It's really fascinating stuff. Um, uh, let me just uh, shift a little bit to, to, to your own background. We heard a little bit about it from Bill in the, in the introduction. Uh, I, 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 it seems a, a tad unusual to start out in, in ethnomusicology. And, and I think I saw something on one of, the, one of your bios about playing bagpipes in Hungary and then to end up with a PhD uh, in computer science and working at Microsoft Research. So I'm curious, just sort of um, how, how have you sort of found that journey? Uh, how did you find your way uh, uh, to, to where you find yourself now? Um, as, as I get older, that journey is becoming longer and harder to explain, but I think um, it, it's, it was really about following things that I, that I felt were, were meaningful. And I, so ethnomusicology may not be a field people have heard of, but anthropology may be something similar. And anthropology is, is really this, the study of the system of culture. And I had done a lot of maths at Commonwealth. I had then done a lot of maths in university, but I just couldn't quite get my head, you know, interest into numbers. Like what was the implication of the numbers for the world? Um, but I thought anthropology was that same kind of systematic thinking about the world, but with people at the center of it. Um, so ethnomusicology take, took me to Hungary, took me to understanding the role of, of music in a, a, a post-socialist environment and the way that, that it was people were negotiating their cultures around that. Then took me into teaching in, in one of Hungary's famous school for, for mathematicians. Um, and I, I met computers really in the classroom for the first time. I, I have to admit, I grew up in a generation where there were computers around in schools, but it wasn't really a central part of the, of the classroom. Um, and all of a sudden I realized as a teacher that, you know, if I really wanted to, to be the one leading my class, I had to have a much better grasp on the technology and technologies need to be designed in ways that enabled interaction between people. Um, Cause they were a significant part of the system that people had kind of thrown in there, but weren't really, hadn't really thought about. And so that took me off to do computer science um, and, and, and life has gone on. But I think that the thing that has held everything together for me is this way of how we look at people people in their surroundings as systems and how do we insert things, whether it be technology or music, that shift that, that, that environment, um, either as, as people are negotiating the only, their world that they live in, um, or in ways where we can proactively shift it in a way to make a fairer or better world. I have, I have one final question, 
And, uh, and, and so just if, if, uh, if anybody, uh, hopefully folks have lots of questions that they would like to ask of Cecily. And so as, uh, as Carly said earlier, you can jump into the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom, hopefully at the bottom of your screen in Zoom and, and uh, uh, get, start getting the questions lined up. Uh, but my, my last question, uh, you knew it was coming, it's the Skynet question. Um, there are more sci-fi films than you can shake a stick at that feature machines learning, becoming smarter, becoming self-aware, and ultimately more or less deciding that they didn't really like being told what to do all the time. And so they sort of take matters into their own hands. So how much do we need to worry about that? But, but perhaps less fancifully, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the ethical issues that have arisen in, in the field that you work in? Sure. Um, I don't think we need to worry too much about it. I think when people worry about that, it's because they need something to worry about. And we all need something to worry about. So, But there may be more productive things we can worry about. Um, but I think what, what is there is really thinking about there, there is a, a real issue around, around skilled labor and, and unskilled, what can we consider unskilled labor? Um, I don't think any labor is unskilled, but um, and 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 the where where machines are going to slot into to our society because they 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 will come they will as our society has always changed technology has always changed the roles that we take AI isn't going to be any any different from that I don't think it's going to be different in the sense it's ever going to take over it is what the people who who build it are and it's, for me one of my passions has always been the more diverse people we have in computer science the more diverse systems and the more thought we have about where they fit into the world. We don't have one type of person saying, this is where they should go. So I'm gonna build out this system. It's about having people with, with a very broad range of, 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 of life experiences that come in and say, well, actually here could be a really useful place. Or here could be a really empowering place that we could put it in. Or if we build it this way, it could be really empowering. If we build it that way, um, actually we're just gonna take over the world. So I've already given the example in the blind community, many people um, who've worked in this field have come in and said, we're just gonna make eyes for people who can't see. You know, that, that's an incredibly disempowering uh, position. But that doesn't mean that AI technology can't be probably one of the most empowering things for the disability community. I think it's gonna completely change the opportunity for many people in that community. At the moment in high income countries, including the US, including the UK, 80% of people with disabilities do not work. That number is even higher for children born with disabilities. I think AI has an incredible role to play in that, but it needs to come from people who understand where it fits in the community. And I think that's true across the whole of our, of our working lives. So for me, I'm very passionate about bringing diverse people into this field so that they bring their life experiences and their perspective into where AI should go. So if people are worried about, about it taking over the world, then maybe they should worry about studying computer science and, and, and making some changes there. Um, but there are, that's not to say there aren't really thoughtful things that we, we, we need to do. Um, We've certainly seen lots of places where AI brings bias into the world, where it enables people in power positions where it shouldn't do. And I think um, I dare to use the term once responsible AI. This is now becoming an important part, certainly within Microsoft, where just like for 10 years, every system we've done has to go through security reviews. Now they have to go through responsible AI reviews. There's a, there's a, a particular process that everyone has to go through. Everyone's had to go through training to think about how do we think about these systems in society? And, and that training to help, not just how do we do it, to make sure people understand that no matter which of the 130,000 employees you might be in Microsoft, you are responsible for how these technologies go into the world. It's not a, well, I just build the back end, so it's not me. You know, every one of us is responsible for some of those really tiny decisions that we might think is just technology could have a big impact on our world. So I think those are one of the real um, step forwards. And I know lots of the other big tech companies are doing them as well. People are taking different perspectives, but I'm particularly proud of what Microsoft is doing to really make sure that we have thought through. It doesn't mean that every single one is going to be right, um, but as a society, we're thinking, thinking it through, thinking it through through having diverse people creating these technologies, thinking it through before they're going out into the world. And most importantly, monitoring what happens when they go out in the world. So if we see unintended consequences, we, we take action quickly. Right. Okay, great. Carly, um, uh, send us some questions and, and we will get some answers. Uh, sure. Carly, you are we, are. Yes, sorry. sorry. Uh, we, we have a number of questions, so I will try to get to as many as I can. Um, the first one is from Brent Whelan. Um, 
are you working with navigating physical as well as social space? Um, will the technology help the user to read as well as identify the adjacent people? And then kind of building off of that, um, could you describe the device you mentioned um, for others to read the blind person's attention? Sure, so that's two questions. Let me tackle, tackle number one. Um, so this work, it was the first step in a much larger vision that we call assistive agents, which is something we're just kicking off now, um, which again, allows you to do that wider thing of, of reading text. And there are already things out there, things like Seeing AI, which is another Microsoft product, um, yeah, we are, we are research, I have to admit, we're not products, so you probably aren't going to see our stuff for a couple of years. But text, people, um, various objects in the, in the environment, one of the things that our research team is particularly focused on is what we call teachable object recognizers. At the moment, we can recognize things we've been trained to recognize, but what if you as a person want to recognize something specific to you that's not in one of these data sets? And there are quite a lot of things not in this data set, particularly if you don't live in the US. Um, so. Um, we're working on that. So how do you enable users to teach and create their own recognizers to recognize in the world? But this goes a, go back again to that, how we build up experiences around AI. So it's quite easy to build up an experience around one kind of information. If you have five kinds of information, all of a sudden there's information everywhere. And, and, and visually we sift the information. We're quite skilled at sifting through that information. But we need to think about ways that, that our user group can be presented to that information audio, which is not, which is a linear form. It's not a spatial form um, per se. And, and also they may not be used to using that information. Um, so how is it that we support that experience of, of multiple, um, multiple pieces of information? That was question one. Shall I go into question two now? You just sure. remind me. <laughs> Yeah, if you could describe um, the device you mentioned um, for others to read the blind person's attention. Sure, so you, you might have seen it in that video. So the, the, the user themselves is wearing a, an adapted HoloLens device. A HoloLens is a, is a, a mixed reality device. We've taken off the lenses because they don't need to see anything. So it's just a, a sensor bar with a bunch of spatialized uh, audio headset, um, battery and compute and things like that. Um, but we put on top of that a semi-circular um, uh, LED strip. And this LED strip tracks in a white light the person who's in closest communication difference. And as they move, and once they've hit center, that light turns green. And at the same time as when they've been identified to the user. So there's, a, there's a, a pairing of visual and auditory information between the communicator and the, and the user. Great, thank you. Um, this is an interesting one, very relevant to the times. Uh, do masks pose challenges for facial recognition on AI? Yes, <laughs> big challenges. <laughs> uh, we are working on this at the, at the moment, uh, since a lot of our technology will be used to support the back to work initiatives um, in the States, particularly people with disabilities who, are, who have, uh, will be hard hit when a lot of their strategies that may be in place aren't going to work. Um, just a, a quick a quick primer on how a lot of facial recognition works. There are different types of algorithms, but a lot of the ones that work particularly well get facial landmarks. Now, depending on where the mask is, they will, they will hide a significant number of facial landmarks. Um, and that's probably not gonna be too bad if the person is directly face on because then it's quite easy to identify them. The problem in a system like ours is we need to be able to identify them regardless of where their head position is. So we, we, we significantly reduce the amount of, of uh, data that, that we have. Recognizing that someone has a mask on, probably not so difficult, um, but how we get around the fundamental change to our algorithms that require facial landmarks is something that uh, there are lots of smart brains working on, but it's, it's not just a matter of um, data, although that's one thing we can do. We can create what we call synthetic data where we can create all different kinds of masks, all in different kinds of positions, train on that, but it's, it's, it's a fundamentally embedded in, in the structure of our, the algorithms that are being used. So we, we have, people are addressing it, but it's tricky. I'm sure. Um, has your team researched blind people from different cultures or geographies? Um, and has that generated any insights that have impacted your product roadmap? Sure, so let me just, just to people often talk about product, just so you be clear, we're, we're in research. So our, what we do doesn't necessarily uh, go to product. Um, although I always hope that what we do does. 
Um, but yes, we have actually, in the very beginning of our work, we were working in the, the UK, in Brazil, and in India. Um, what I would have thought of being very different environments. I thought India, the kind of challenges that they had there would have been very different than the kind of challenges in the UK, specifically just practical navigation is hard for everybody. I can't quite imagine um, the working in that kind of unreliable environment when, when you can't see. Um, but it was interesting across cultures that the most fundamental thing for people was people. Um, people, were, people were good because what makes us people is other people. You know, the social interaction was far more important for people than the, than the, the, the more practical challenges that we often might think stand in people's way. Um, but people are also really useful. People were not shy about asking for help. They didn't find asking for help to be demeaning or difficult. Um, they like to have choice about who they ask for help. So again, a lot of what we were doing is trying to support that choice, um, make that choice easier perhaps by who's in a uniform or um, you know, who, who might be not moving and therefore, therefore an easier person to approach. Um, but yeah, and, and people seem to be one of the things that it was hardest to get around. You could always ask, you know, what, what, what denomination is, or what, uh, what bill am I holding? Um, but asking people about, are they smiling or who are they seem to be a lot more awkward. Um, so yeah, so we were quite interested to find that across, across the world, people, people was the main priority for, for others. I think the only real difference that we found that struck us and one we couldn't really address at the time was that there was a much higher level of discrimination going on for people in India, for example, than in the US, direct discrimination. Like for example, the, none, of the, none of the ATMs at the time, I think that's changed now, were, were talking ATMs. So they had to get other people to get their money and even their relatives would take a tip. Um, so that kind of thing that really um, was quite debasing for, for many of those people. Um, Great. Um, so we have two questions that came through about this. Um, do you see an application of this work, your work, your team's work, um, helping people, sighted people with autism, um, or is and or is anyone currently working on that? Sure. Um, we've been approached by quite a lot of uh, clinical people um, saying, yes, let's use this for, for autism. Um, we haven't pursued it yet at the moment. And one of my concerns is watching how deeply the blind community came and took over these technologies. I would want to see the same process, or at least a, maybe a shorter process, but a similar process in, within the autism community about how they felt this would be useful for them. What I have seen in the autism community, I, I personally don't, don't support. There's a lot of work working very superficially um, on the kind of outcomes that clinicians and teachers are looking for. So have they made direct eye contact? Have they smiled? But none of those things, I, I question about where those, those challenges are coming from and, and, and is technology the right answer for those? Just because they look the same, I don't yet have any um, experience to suggest that they are the same. Great, thank you. Um, and then building off of that a bit, um, what kinds of other applications for this technology are you working on, thinking about, or just vaguely aware of? <laughs> um, well, that's one of the, we, in research, we often call these moonshots because they're things that take you 10 years to solve and the expectations you solve lots of things along, along the way. And that's most definitely been true. So what are a few of those? Um, so first of all, all of, the, all of the people tracking that we built a couple of years ago was tech transferred into Microsoft products. So into things like Teams, which you might be familiar with. Um, and a lot of the to teachable object recognition things that we're doing and a lot of the changes that we're making to make algorithms more robust to noisy data. A lot of that will move into, like Microsoft has something called custom vision. So it, it will move into products uh, like that that are working in real world settings. Um, so a lot of our, all of our work, I shouldn't say a lot, I would say absolutely everything we do will, will transfer into supporting um, different parts of, of things going on, at, on in Microsoft. Um, and not least, we are the, the example now that's being used to train the whole of Microsoft in responsible AI and some of the challenges that we have faced in terms of um, how do you enable the blind child in school, but how do you protect 
a child who is, I don't know the US term, but we call it the protected register. So a child who has a, who maybe has a, an adult who has a restraining order, um, how do you protect those two children in the same space? So a lot of the thinking we did around those kind of complex questions is now being used to challenge and to help engineers teams across the company think through um, what does it mean to be responsible and what is their role in it? Great, thank you. Um, and it, it sounds like you, you answered this a bit, but I just wanna clarify, um, is this technology currently in being AI or Soundscape within Microsoft? Um, currently, no, but you will be seeing bits, bits and bobs of this uh, coming into seeing AI within, within the next year. Um, seeing AI as a phone platform, um, so it's very different than a head-worn experience. Um, but a lot of the work we've done around, around people tracking, around experiences for exploring spaces uh, non-visually, uh, and some of our teachable object recognition will be going into seeing AI. Soundscape doesn't have a camera, by the way. Otherwise, we would work with them too. <laughs> Great. Well, that was all of the wonderful questions. Um, oh, I see one that just came in from Bill Wharton. Um, how has this work changed you and the way you interact with others in the world? Um, I think it, the work rather took to me rather than me to the work, I have to admit. Um, so as some of you may know, um, I have a blind child and it was because of this that I was approached and said, would I do this? And I said, no, 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 no. You know there's personal and then there's work and those things should stay apart. Um, but I think eventually my, my manager said to me, look, either you do it well or someone else is going to do it badly, make your choice. And I think, um, I think it was through that journey of, of coming to terms of doing this and realizing that how much impact you can have if you have a special set of skills or special insight into the world. Um, that's sort of taking me on this journey and, and all the things that the you know, incredible teams that I've worked with. Um, so it's changed me in that regard is coming to accept that, that we can each bring our, our own experiences. It's not about skills and, and you know, moving forward in a career, but it's about bringing the skills and the experiences we have to impact the world. And I think I've been amazingly lucky to be in a situation to do that. Well, thank you so much. Um for taking the time and for sharing um, about your incredible work and your personal background as well. Really appreciate it. Um, any closing remarks um, from either Cecily or David? Um, we are coming to the end of our time and, and don't have any other questions from the audience, but um, anything you wanna close out with? Uh, I can just close, whereas um, I, I'm guessing there are some some Commonwealth students or Commonwealth parents out there. And I think one of the special things for me about Commonwealth was not to restrain that journey and not to, to I think, prepare me slightly for this crazy journey I've taken in life, but one that's always been directed by impacting the world and sort of moving, trusting in that, that, that you know, you can bring your knowledge to the world in a way that's special and unique to, to your experiences. And I feel like Commonwealth has done a great job setting me up uh, for that. And not, not all of my colleagues have, have been, it's been a harder journey for them to, to get to that point. Well, that sounds like a great, uh, like a great close. Uh, uh, I cannot improve on that other than to thank you, Cecily, so much for doing this. Um, I, I have learned a great deal uh, in the course of this hour and of course of our previous conversations. And uh, I'm sure that's true of others as well. Thank you to everybody for, for tuning in. Um, really very much appreciate it and, and uh, uh, tune in next time and I'll toss it off, uh, toss it over to Bill. No, thank you very much. We want, I want to thank uh, Cecily again. It, it's wonderful to see you and um, you, you, you do us proud um, as, you know, as do you, David, thank you so much. Um, but uh, this was really fascinating and I, I, I look forward to um, the next time uh, hearing what, hearing what you move on to next. Cause it sounds like it's, uh, it, it's certainly going to be really interesting. And I want to thank everybody who showed up. Um, the only regret uh, one, it, it's great that we're all able to zoom into something like this, but for us just to see names in the participant windows, it would be great to be able to mingle for a little while and talk and to catch up. Uh, alas, um, we, we can't do that. 
but we are deeply grateful that you came and, um, and look forward to hearing from you um, in, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you.